Welcome into the Fantasy Football Forge. My name is Steve. This is introduction number three. We're going to try this again, but quicker. So, uh, this is a new series. This is the second video in the series. I've already done an AFC and an NFC North video, so please check that out if you have any interest in that. In this video, of course, we will be focusing on the AFC NFC East. First, I will look at each of the team's um, needs and, and be looking at the changes throughout the offseason. Just a couple of minutes, hopefully maximum per team. Well, we look at that, look at philosophical changes, how that might change how these teams are looking in the draft, what types of players maybe this new regime of coaching staff would be looking for. And once again, that all brings it back to the needs. And uh, your input is definitely welcome in the needs list. Just remember, needs does not only count, account for uh, specific needs this year. I've, I've also looked at the age of um, you know you, the whole group. Uh, on each individual team that might have stuck out to me if they're an older group that hey we need to start thinking about getting a replacement in etc so um, just keep that in mind but uh, I'd very much appreciate any input that you have on the needs because you know your team better than I do and then I will do a three round mock draft where I will only be controlling your teams and I do have the randomness jacked up on the simulator so I, I do believe that that makes it more realistic the fact that uh, some guys that we you know the consensus board is not going to be 100% accurate that is for sure so uh, that just brings a little randomness sometimes it can be a little too random especially early on in the draft but that'll even out as we move along so we'll adjust and adapt if, if anything gets too crazy early on in the draft but other than that um after we do that then i will go back to um just a quick overview of each um you know what i did in comparison to the needs that we have for those teams and i'll try to be as honest uh, about if i like or dislike what i did because uh, do recall I, I may not even like what i did for your team you know it's not gonna every draft doesn't always turn out to be the best or go to plan i think it is time that we get to the slideshow here starting off with the afc east and right up top you can see i do have the current draft value for each team we'll say when simulating it um I'm, it's not going to be like trade heavy i am going to try to remember to keep trades in mind and pause from time to time to see if a team may want to uh move up or or sometimes maybe move down in this draft but uh, it's a little bit harder to control when i'm simulating so many other teams so that's going to bring us on to this offseason here for the Buffalo Bills. Some staff changes. They lost their defensive coordinator, Sean Desai, and they hired Bobby Babick. He is an internal hire. I believe his dad, Bob, actually, I did finally verify this after a while, but it got very tough with Googling that there was a Bobby Babick and a Bob Babick who both joined the Bills staff for the same year in 2017. So uh, hopefully all this information that I gathered is on Bobby and not Bob. Obviously, Bobby also comes directly from a lineage of coaching, as he did join his dad with the Buffalo Bills in 2017. One other team prior to this, he was with his dad, so um, followed his dad around for a little bit. His dad has retired. He is a man of his own doing from this point forward. He has definitely been involved in the development of some good players from the Bills, Jordan Poyer, Micah Hyde, uh, just specifically saying he was the positional coach over these guys uh, while they were very good in the league. Tredavious White as a D-backs coach. And then he moved over to the linebacker position, took over for his dad when his dad moved somewhere else uh, within the organization. And uh, actually when his dad uh, retired and he acquired uh, an already good Tremaine Edmonds, but he helped to develop Matt Milano and Terrell Terrell Bernard, um, who I personally like a lot. Sean McDermott calls the plays, so I don't expect this to have a major impact in the on-field production outside of being a good sign for the further development of players on the Bills roster and the rookies, etc. So, um, yeah, it seems to be a very developmental-focused uh, hire there at defensive coordinator, which... Uh, can't argue with that. As far as the offensive coordinator, they did lose Ken Dorsey last season. They hired Joe Brady. He came in. We saw him uh, as the interim head uh, offensive coordinator for a decent period last season, as this all happened mid-season. Joe Brady uh, was the interim after mid-season firing of Ken Dorsey. Depending who you talk to, Joe Brady is either a genius or a total putz. He's had success and he's had failure, which is how he ended up semi-buried on the Buffalo Bills staff leading up to his promotion last year to OC. Philosophically, Joe Brady likes to utilize the field sideline to sideline horizontally in an attempt to keep the defense thin across the board and get his receivers the ball in open space so that they can then make plays after, you know, with the ball in, 
in open space. This would explain the addition of a guy like Curtis Samuel to the roster. Definitely makes some sense there. We also saw a commitment to the run game that we previously had not seen last year under Joe Brady. Uh, actually, that was under Ken Dorsey. We saw the commitment once Joe Brady took over, so you like that for the run game. Lastly, we saw Stephon Diggs fall off and become more of a distraction than anything in their offense. I'm not sure what to do with that bit of information. Uh, and I believe that must have been written before Stephon Diggs actually left uh, Buffalo. We go to the needs. As you can see, wide receiver has uh, jumped up, and each time I have like maybe a bit of a tier change in the needs, uh, then we have that little straight bar. So offensive line here, am I right on this? I've got offensive guard being a little bit more of a need than the offensive tackle. I also have uh, that center is not a need because you have Connor McGovern, I believe, is supposed to be taking over as your center. Um, you know, have you heard any reporting on what their plan is with that offensive line? How am I doing with those needs? Let me know, Buffalo fan. That would help. Let's move on to the Miami Dolphins, who lost uh, defensive coordinator Vic Fangio. By the way, I use the terminology lost here. Um, sometimes they were fired. Sometimes they left for other jobs, etc. It was just easiest to keep it in one language. Um, it doesn't really matter if they were fired or not. Just this, they're no longer there. As far as the draft picks go for Miami Dolphins, uh, pick a first round, a second round pick, no third round pick. So um, they are a candidate, I believe, to be moving back. They'll be open to listening to trade offers uh, with both of these picks, I think, given uh, they are in also, uh, you know, their, their window was the most open last year. It's starting to close. They also can probably do a quick reset but uh, money issues, et cetera, are at the heart of why this window's closing. And so uh, I think bringing in more people and just taking sh more shots is going to be, uh, would be a solid strategy for the Miami Dolphins rather than caring about high-end talent because you, you do have that high-end talent. You spend a lot of money on it. Uh, for the most part, you still have it, you know, but that ages every year too. So I think a little mini, mini reset, bringing in more people would be more helpful than not for Miami personally. Uh, so that brings us to the the loss of Vic Fangio, the hire of Anthony Weaver. Uh, all in all, with this new hire, loss of Vic Fangio, I think that this works for Miami's defense in terms of the personnel that they have better than what Vic Fangio was. But let's see here. Weaver has basically been a defensive line coach for the entirety of his career, with a little more on his plate than that at times, mostly in recent history with the Ravens, who he is, was with from uh, 2021 to and three seasons. Vic ran a lot of zone coverage and uses press man very little. Uh, that is where did not love, you know, would like to see more press man types of coverage given the personnel that they have in Miami uh, last season specifically, but also moving forward. And that is important to note because much of their secondary thrives in press man coverage. Ultimately, for this new Anthony Weaver defense, uh, two words are were the uh, primary buzzwords that I found coming out of the mouth of Mr. Weaver, and those were multiple and flexible to describe what he'll be bringing over from his experience in Baltimore. Ultimately, that basically means it's a hybrid defense. 4-3-3-4 uh, three, three, doesn't really matter. Depends the play, depends the play call, but your personnel are going to be able to be able, you're going to have not only flexible guys who can, uh, you know, work in, in either kind of, any kind of base defense, but you're also going to have multiple dudes waiting you know a rotation that can also help to change things up on the field uh, change the dynamic the chemistry of your own defense uh, very quickly ultimately he wants to be a more physical unit and that's once again i think in favor of the type of players that miami has on defense overall and i do believe that that will uh initially be more man coverage than was used under fangio Although the league does tend to use a lot more zone coverage, uh, the man coverage is very important. And zone match is also a thing which is very close to man coverage. That's going to bring us on to the New England Patriots. They've got a first, second, third round draft capital. So sitting pretty as far as draft capital goes. There have been a lot of staff changes in New England. Very much reported on here where I'm sure Bill Belichick is no longer with the Patriots. They did hire, internal hire here, Gerard Mayo who is a Bill Belichick project, the heir apparent, and he has no other experience since his college days in terms of NFL 
knowledge system. The Patriot way is what we can expect his philosophy to be. If you're unfamiliar, he is an ex linebacker drafted by the Patriots only played for the Patriots before he retired. And then just shortly after retirement came and joined the Patriots staff as a, uh, a coach on the defensive side of the ball, which is his bread and butter, just like Belichick. So this is not a full regime change here in new England philosophically, but I'm sure uh, you know, Gerard Mayo will bring his own influences in, but just understand professionally, since college, his only influences really have been from this staff, uh, the New England way. As far as defensive coordinator, they did not have a true defensive coordinator on the previous staff with Bill Belichick. That was his job. And then I think his son did a lot of just like the play calling or something in game. He was kind of the de facto DC, but he wasn't a defensive coordinator. Um, they have a weird structure there in New England. Not every structure is the same. As far as their hire, Demarcus Covington, uh, this is an internal hire as well. He's been with the Patriots since uh, 2017, and he potentially worked very closely with Gerard Mayo for at least the year 2019, where they would have been in position groups that would have needed to, to stay in contact with each other as the coaches. Defensively, I am sure there will be some changes, but all in all, it's Belichick staff taking over the show yet again on that side of the ball. But here is the side of the ball where we do see some changes. We do see different flavors come in from time to time for New England. Um, and uh, they tried that last year with Bill O'Brien. Uh, did not work out. They got rid of him. New hire here, Alex Van Pelt. Alex has been around the league for nearly two decades at this point, and he's been a on a lot of staffs. Most recently, he was the offensive coordinator for the Cleveland Browns. One of my criticisms there was that he clearly didn't have the ability to adapt his system to the strength of his quarterback, Deshaun Watson. That's potentially concerning to me for any kind of incoming new quarterback uh, if they don't operate very well from directly behind the center where Alex Van Pelt will have their quarterback more often than not if not almost always then uh, is he going to be willing to adapt and change I don't know uh, he is going to be running a run first west coast type of scheme which is a good fit for any kind of defensive oriented team I believe so uh no problem there that it is closest to the modern wave of the NFL too, which is kind of based off of West coast, uh, ideologies, just modernized changed. Alex claims that he is not a square peg in a round hole kind of guy. I don't think anybody claims to be that anymore in the NFL, uh, even in the, when they were, when that was the primary ideology, I don't think anybody would have said, Oh yeah, I just, I don't care what the talents are of my guys. I just try to, you know, they just have to work within my system. But I'm just, it's its one thing to say it, it's one thing to have that as a philosophy, and it's another thing to actually be able to do that. Uh, and the most successful coaches are very adaptive year in and year out. But I'm just not fully sold on the fact that Alex Van Pelt is highly adaptive. Nonetheless, overall, I think the fit here does have potential. Just hopefully they get the right quarterback in there for Alex Van Pelt. Uh, somebody who likes being behind the center would be what I think they're looking for at quarterback. That's going to bring us on to the New York Jets uh, draft picks. No second round draft pick. So they are in a bit of a capital uh, deficit here. We'll keep our eyes open at pick 10 to moving back, but we are in a window here as far as the Jets go. So we don't mind getting uh, top end talent at pick 10 either. We'll see what happens there. No staff changes, uh, no major st coaching changes. I think that's the right call. You know, you're in a window. You don't need to. Even if you don't love what's going on as a GM or something, now is not the time to be changing that. As far as uh, key additions, you can see those. Lots of offensive line focus there, which was necessary. And as far as the needs go, we got a safety uh, at the top of the needs list now. Interior defensive line, wide receiver, next tier, O-line def, um, next tier. Uh, do you disagree with that? Should that be higher? Let me know. Uh would be open later on yeah, at some point in this draft to just taking a shot on a quarterback for the future. Let's go on to the NFC North, starting off with the Dallas Cowboys. Uh, first, second, third round draft capital, so we're good there. No major coaching changes there. They have not done much in free agency, unfortunately, which has left them with a fair bit of needs here. Um, one of the teams who actually has more serious needs than most teams, which we're not used to for Dallas, but uh, they haven't done much to uh, 
recoup what they've lost in free agency as far as the offensive line goes there, as you can see. So that's really the prime importance round one there. Uh, running back, we would like to get a good running back, I think, in this draft. Cornerback, wide receiver, also still surprisingly needs there, despite how good of a uh, few cornerbacks that they do have there in uh, Dallas. So let me know, Dallas fan, if we need to do, uh, we need to alter those needs there. But that's going to bring us on to the New York Giants, who have a first, a second, and a third round draft pick. So that's nice. Staff changes. Uh, they lost a defensive coordinator, Don Wink Martindale, and they hired Shane Bowen. And this is a true philosophical change in terms of these two defensive minds. What we are going to see from Shane Bowen is a zone-heavy 3-4 scheme. I couldn't find for sure as far as Wink Martindale if he was a 4-3, but I think that was I think he was running 4-3 there previously uh, in New York. So we're going to move to a 3-4, just something to keep in mind. And there's going to be a focus. Once again, though, as far as the 3-4, 4-3 thing, I don't care too much because teams run out of the nickel the most. Um, and and there's, there's so many things that you can do with players and schemes and, and, and play calling that um, you can make it work. What you really want is the best player on your team. Another big philosophical change. Don uh, Martindale, wink, uh, didn't really care to stuff the run, um, which I think is pretty common around the league. It's become less uh, of a primary focus for a lot of defenses. But uh, Shane Bowen is going to have a focus on stopping the run. So big difference there. And also, uh, as far as Shane Bowen's defenses have been, they do not force a lot of turnovers. So don't expect that. The focus is more on um, following your assignments, playing smart. And uh, yeah, just just, uh, more about being where you should be on a play. Those are some of your philosophical changes there for Shane Bowen. The zone heavy, you know, we'll keep that in mind as far as cornerbacks go. Uh, that's one of the needs there. And also, um, there we'll, we'll keep the fact that they want, you know, smart players more so than like the top athletic players, uh, I think will be another key uh, ingredient to think about for New York when we're picking between a couple of players. Now, uh, the Giants specifically for New York. That's going to bring us on to the Philadelphia Eagles and uh, draft capital uh, two second round picks. So we're good there. No third round pick, unfortunately, and a second and a first rounder. So we're in surplus of capital here with the two second round picks. As far as uh, Philly goes, staff changes. We did lose. They did lose their defensive coordinator. Sean Desai hired Vic Fangio from Miami. So Vic, this is the modern uh, defense that has been sought out by so many defenses that's been successful. Uh, it's just the two high shell D, 3-4 front, zone heavy. His D is, once again, the defensive choice around the league. Vic has worked and learned from legends of years past like Steve Sidwell, Dom Capers, Jim Mara, and Rex Ryan, amongst others. It's not a blitz-heavy scheme, so high-end edge talent is a must because you need the guys who are going down in and down out to to create that kind of pressure so that way uh, your guys on the back end aren't exposed uh, and and can hopefully take advantage of some errant throws from time to time. As far as the linebacker goes, you want an athletic linebacker. And so I think that uh, a couple of years ago, Philadelphia did draft this guy, a guy who should work well in the system, and that is going to be Nicobe Dean. So uh, as far as that primary uh, big linebacker piece into the Vic Fangio defense, I do believe that they have that already. And safety play is absolutely critical as well. The The big question here is going to be, can slash will Sidney Brown step up in year two? And I believe that he can and will. Sidney Brown was a my guy last year, so I absolutely love him. But uh, it, it can't hurt, as you can see on the needs list, to bring in another safety into this group. Offensive coordinator Brian Johnson uh, no longer with Philadelphia. They hired Kellen Moore. So interesting hire here. He prefers a strong run game. Uh, not that he always has that. That was a surprise for me with the Los Angeles Chargers that they didn't bring in a running back in the draft last year to uh, help to develop a stronger run game because I think that's a huge part of Kellen Moore's offense. 
And he tried running that without that. Um, Going to be more of a Shanahan style of offense. That's what Kellen Moore wants. Outside zone is the preference in terms of the running game. He loves play action. Once again, the importance of the running game. You can't run play action without a successful run game to distract the defense. Otherwise, you're just going to get sacked and pressured uh, before the play can develop at all. Then he also likes to have a lot of motion. That's a very modern uh, tactic. Just want to highlight a receiver who I would love for Philly for one reason, and I hate for Philly for another reason. That is Xavier Worthy. And I think that uh, that addition of lots of motion, it's it's just perfect. Uh, he also runs a lot of 11 personnel, by the way. So three wide receiver, also something that Kellen Moore needs. And uh, frankly, Philly does not have a very good third wide receiver. So that is... Definitely a need in this draft, and I would love Xavier Worthy for the system on the team with the other weapons that they have, but cold weather. Can Xavier Worthy play in cold weather? I would have definite concerns about that. Now, we do see that they do have wide receivers there that don't like the cold weather very much at all, so uh, maybe they won't care about that. They'll just say, deal with it, Xavier, but uh, that would be a concern, you know, him taking shots in cold weather. Uh, you might get alligator armed very quickly and start dropping balls. And um, that would be the concern there. But just, you know, if it happens in the draft, freaking awesome. Uh, it's kind of not a route that I'm going to focus on going after, though, just because of those concerns. And also, um, Kellen Moore is flexible and evolves based on his personnel. So, you know, based on what he has, uh, this offense will look a little bit different than it did in Dallas and will look different than it looked in with, with the Chargers. Uh, he is somebody who is going to uh, not try to put a square peg in a round hole. However that saying goes, that's going to finish it off here with the Washington Commanders. And um, let's see. We've got, we've got staff changes here, a whole regime change. So uh, check out the needs there. Key additions, they've been busy, so that's good. Staff changes, they've been busy, so we'll see how that turns out. They lost head coach Ron Rivera, hired Dan Quinn. So their focus will be on the defense. I always find this interesting when you're getting a new quarterback, young quarterback. I feel like you would want to go offensive-minded, especially in this league, but... Um, not the route that Washington went. And so he has been in the league for over uh, two decades. That is Dan, John, Dan Quinn. His most recent job has been with the Dallas Cowboys as their defensive coordinator. Key influences on him include Steve Mariucci, Nick Saban, Eric Mangini, Jim Mara, Pete Carroll, Mike McCarthy. So uh, wealth of information. And uh, Dan has kind of put all that knowledge together to have some really good defenses as of late. As far as what Dan wants on both sides of the ball, it comes down to two words, explosive and physical. And he did bring in uh, his little minion here in Joe Witt Jr. as they got rid of Jack Del Rio, defensive coordinator. Uh, so bringing in Joe Witt, Dan Quinn uh, equals pre-snap chaos with classic simple coverages. 4-3 hybrid defense is what we're going to be looking at. And Joe Witt's uh, you know, going to run the Dan Quinn defense here. So that's what you can expect. A lot of chaos, but ultimately the, the concept is simple. It just looks complex from the outside is how it's supposed to be interpreted. That hybrid defense always helps with that. Once again, that's like the Ravens run that defense. I've always liked uh, more of a hybrid defense as a philosophy. He spent years with Mike McCarthy. That is the connection to Dan Quinn. So, oh, maybe I've got the wrong guy here. Joe Witt, um, maybe it was not a Dan Quinn minion. He was with Dan in Dallas since 2021. Oh, that was how they originally, the connection happened. All right. And they were both in Atlanta for a year together in 2020. So it was prior to 2020 that their connection was Mike McCarthy and uh, how they probably kind of got back together. And then since then, Joe Witt has been Dan Quinn's uh, right-hand man for the past four years. Much like Dan Quinn's defense did in Dallas, Joe Witt has a propensity to get a high turnover rate with his defensive backs. Joe Witt chooses violence. He wants his players running and hitting. So um, we, we want playmakers. We want speed, explosiveness, violence, effort, kind of, uh, you know, I think what, what the average fan thinks of every defensive coordinator probably wants as the exciting guys ultimately is what we're looking at. Uh, you know, give us give us an athlete and we'll make a football player out of kind of mentality. That's going to bring us on to the uh, last change here on the coaching staff. Eric Bieniemy, offensive coordinator, getting switched out for Cliff Kingsbury. Um, 
Personally, I like Eric Bieniemy much more than Kingsbury, so I'm not overly excited about uh, the Cliff Kingsbury addition here for Washington or for whatever quarterback uh, comes into this. So let's start out by saying that I'm not a Cliff Kingsbury believer. My big issue with Cliff, Cliff Kingsbury is that I think his offenses are far too stagnant and predictable. He puts guys into a role and he doesn't deviate from those roles at all. I don't think there's any kind of uh, confusion for the opposing team. You kind of just... It's go win it. Uh, be the better player. And sometimes you just don't have the better players on the field. Uh, with that off of my chest, I do love a spread offense, which is what Cliff employs. The goal for Cliff is to get favorable man-to-man matchups and then attack those matchups. Most everything will be run out of the shotgun, so that is something to keep in mind in terms of the quarterback that they get. Uh, this shotgun versus you know right behind center argument could be what it really comes down to as far as which quarterback these guys like uh, these teams like at two and three between them and new england and luckily for them they're both looking for something different in terms of that one little factor so something to keep in mind uh as far as the run game goes for cliff kingsbury that will not be the primary focus for this offense but just because it's a spread offense uh, where the focus is the passing game that does not mean that they're not going to run the ball plenty while he was in arizona not only did they have a good running game but they also did they were in like roughly just average uh, in the league as far as rushing attempts go so uh don't worry too much about that my big question for the running game however is going to be the current running back room uh, they don't feel, feature much in terms of dual threat running backs, which is kind of what you need. I don't really see that kind of talent in the running back room right now. Cliff overhauled his air raid offense when he came to the NFL the first time, and maybe that's why it got stagnant, because he had a lot to change, and then he got comfortable with whatever he changed, and uh, felt that it was good enough. I don't know. So I will be looking for him to add a few more twists and turns after taking a step back from the NFL from having those head coach duties all on his platter, maybe just couldn't find the time to retool that offense and make it better for the NFL. Uh, but I, I, like I said, I like the ideology of a Cliff Kingsbury offense. I just have not been impressed with Cliff himself. So we shall see. And that's going to bring us on to the fun part here. The muck draft. All right. Let me get hydrated up and let's go. All right, so for Washington, first up on the board here, um, uh, another argument for Jaden Daniels versus Drake May is just going to be how they played in college and what Cliff Kingsbury is looking for. Um, I think some people say uh, Jaden Daniels because of his ability to run more, but uh, Drake May is plenty athletic himself. Uh, He can run very well. Uh, I think the bigger deal is just the comfort level of where they were in college to now, and then the immediate playability of Jaden Daniels versus Drake May, who maybe you want to sit for at least like six weeks or something like that, uh, depending on exactly where he comes in. I mean, I, I think you can throw him out there day one, but there is that concern. So let's just go with Jaden Daniels there. I'm, I guess, uh, starting to become more on board with this. And for New England, do I want to trade back? I don't. If, if I am the GM here of New England, uh, I'm just taking the quarterback when I get the shot. I don't really care what the offer is here. I ain't doing it. So that's the route we're going to go. We're going to take Drake May, and that's going to bring the New York Giants onto the clock next. So we see Joe Alt go, Marvin Harrison go. I think personally, I'm just going to do what I normally do here. Nothing too creative for the Giants, although... Who is looking to come up here? Is that realistic? What do you? What's Atlanta looking to come up for? That doesn't feel right. I don't believe that. Now the New York Jets looking to come up. I could believe. We have to assume we're not getting one of these top wide receivers if that happens, which means we're going to go cornerback. It is a deep wide receiver draft. But if I'm looking for a true X wide receiver, there are only so many of those. And Roma Dunze is one of them. I have Malik Labors higher up on my draft board, um, but it's not such a huge spread that I'm not going to go for what I need a little bit between these two. And I just, I feel very confident that Roma Dunze is going to be successful at the NFL level. So let's just do that. And then how can I pause? Oh, Okay. Thinking of moving up maybe for the Jets. 
I hate this that we cannot look at what's available. That being said, I think we're fine uh, just holding off here. And, oh no, Brock Bowers goes. I, I was hoping for Brock Bowers. Uh, maybe I should have traded up with Chicago for Brock Bowers. So, if I'm going to contemplate going interior defensive line here with this first pick, I got to trade out of this spot. I don't want to, I'm not taking the next category of wide receiver. I've done enough on my offensive line that, although, I mean, it's very tempting. Uh, I'll think about that with the next pick, but where can we trade to? Las Vegas is looking to come up. Are they looking for a quarterback? Quite possible. That could be the play. So let's do that. That seems realistic enough. Maybe. Or do we want to listen to... I don't think the Rams are going to want to move up. New Orleans doesn't usually move. <laughs> and then I don't think we want to move all the way back to like 31. So let's see what we can get from Vegas. All right, so we're playing a little bit of hardball with Vegas. Uh, this is a little bit too much capital, but we think they're coming up for a quarterback. We think they're pretty desperate. So what we do do is uh, we'll we'll toss in a future six rounder. Okay, that's all. Uh, Eighty eight was like the perfect spot for capital. So this is like uh, twenty five percent tax on uh, on this thirteen to ten move here at pick seventy seven. So we'll give you a little bit of something, but uh, assume you're coming up here for a quarterback. Las Vegas, right? Is that what you're doing? No. Talisa Fuanga. And then quarterback, Edge. All right. Well, Fuanga was the main target here as far as offensive line goes, but we are also very interested in, in getting uh, Byron Murphy or Jerzon Newton here. The two early third-round picks we could get. It's not a terrible spot for wide receiver for sure. Uh, might need to move up a couple spots from like 72 if possible to secure a wide receiver of choice and um, offensive line there's kind of a dull period mid second round it starts to pick up again there okay so what I'm debating I'm currently I do have an offering from Seattle could we do the double jump back I'm trying to figure out would Seattle really be coming up here and who are they coming up for would Seattle be willing to do this? Let's see. Yeah, I mean, I just don't have... The next time Seattle would be on the clock is 102. I can't do that to Seattle. I don't see them as a team that's looking to move up here uh, in this draft. Just doesn't make enough sense. Sorry, New York. But uh, we are going to go Byron Murphy here. Let's see how this plays out. We have those third-round picks, so let's see what we get out of that. Interesting Grant Barton there to Pittsburgh. Uh, it's probably a, a target that we would have liked. Definitely looking to move back from here. Jerzon Newton also very, very tempting. So let's see here. Um, Minnesota, a couple spots. Tampa Bay, Buffalo. I think Buffalo is a team who could be looking to move up here. I think we could risk it. Let's risk it. Let's see what happens. If we go back to Buffalo, 28, what can we get from you? Nope, we're not very good trade partners. This isn't going to work. There's too much of a gap. Ugh. Well, if Tampa really wants a guy, I don't see any reason they wouldn't be willing to do this. This is what the trade looks like. So we're going to move back five spots and move 158 all the way into 92. Philly on the clock. I was getting very close to going with the typical Nate Wiggins, Kool-Aid McKinsey. You're kind of trying to debate between the two which one Philly might prefer. I was like, well, let me check out the edge rusher room because I do have a note here that uh, high-end edge talent is a must. Uh, I mean, I'm a little bit lower on Dallas Turner than average, but this is a good fit. The 3-4 front. Uh, you want athletic linebacker play. Uh, it doesn't get much more athletic and much more of a fit than Dallas Turner here. So I'm going to go that route, and I'm interested, Philly fan. What, do you like that? Let's see how the rest of the draft goes as well for them. But uh, curious what your take is on that. Uh, obviously not the biggest need for them. Dallas on the clock next, offensive line. I was, I mean, yeah, give me a Maris Mims. I, I just could, you know, Nate Wiggins is interesting. I have a Maris Mims ranked as my second or maybe third uh, offensive lineman. 
Might have moved him back one spot recently, but uh, right up there just because of the ceiling. Kool Aid goes to Green Bay. That's probably what I would have done there. Um, or, yeah, probably over Nate Wiggins. And then we wanted Jerzon. We wanted Johnny. We got him. Let's go for it, right? I wonder if a move up is possible for offensive line there in Miami. All right, Buffalo on the clock. Cornerback, we do have as a need. It's the last need that I have on my needs list, however. Uh, and three tiers out of three tiers in. So the question is going to be best player available. I mean, is a, Brian Thomas Jr. such a nice fit for Buffalo? I'm not the biggest Brian Thomas Jr. fan, but out of who's left, yeah makes enough sense but uh, i think that's easy enough we'll go btj there I'm not even i mean i do like to think about moving back but yeah you're probably trying to come up for wide receiver carolina you can suck it no thank you brian thomas hey wiggins still on the board here look at that balling somebody want to trade up for nate wiggins jacksonville that's too far back. We want a wide receiver now. Um, I'm going to go Lad McConkie. He's my number five wide receiver. Oh, there goes Jordan Morgan. And so Jordan Morgan would have been the target for Miami wanting to come up here. Unfortunately, uh, he couldn't quite make that happen. So he's off the board. However, I do have a new plan for them, so they're not looking to move up anymore. Uh, the, the phone calls have ceased from Miami to move up. With that, uh, Washington comes up on the board next, and what did we do for them? We got a quarterback, of course. So we got the world is our oyster. I don't know. You know, if there's one defense for Joe Wiggins, for Nate Wiggins, I don't think it's the Washington defense. You can't do that. We want fast, hard hitting. You know what? I've I've got willing tackler for Nate Wiggins. Um. He's probably never going to be the best tackler, but he's willing. And uh, I feel like at this point, the talent is too good. So I think I'll overlook my complete uh, preferences if I'm Washington and take Nate Wiggins. A couple of offensive linemen went off right behind me, so that wasn't the best. But uh, mostly okay with that. I like Patrick Paul. I know a lot of you don't based on Pittsburgh's reaction to their draft. Patrick Paul at 60, um, and it is early. And well, I've been I've been sitting here thinking about this for too long. I would really like to address offensive line here, um, but it just uh, doesn't match the board. So we are going to go with Tyler Newbin, who should be a good fit. Maybe, maybe the current coaching staff would prefer Javon Bullard over Newbin, um, and maybe we could look to trading back here with L.A. All right, well, this should do. We're going to pick up pick 99 here from the Rams. Rams are going to move up 12 spots to pick 40, and we'll also move pick 222 up to 196. Uh, it's, it's a good enough offer for what's on the board here for Washington with enough needs that will take the extra capital there at pick 99. And we'll go for it. Let's see what happens. Well, the big board's got uh, Tyler Newbin going a little bit earlier than TJ Tampa. So we'll trust, or higher, I should say, ranked. We'll go with that. Uh, it's close for me. Very close. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, I got Cornerback just as high up on the board. We can get guard later in the draft if need be. And tackle is not an immediate concern. So, okay. Hope. Oh, kind of wanted to pause that for Miami to get a chance to trade up here, but you, you weren't uh, reacting quick enough there, Miami. So, Washington, what you got here? To me, it's between these two and no others. Really, Jonah Ellis, Marshawn Nealon there. But I'm at a bit of a standstill here. Uh... I think what we really want is pass rush, and that's Jonah Ellis. I have Jonah Ellis also higher on my board than Marshawn Nealon, um, but both of them second-round talents. Uh, 
And Marshawn Neeland is more of a three down player, fits the run a little bit better than Jonah Ellis. Quite a bit better, probably. Yeah. Marshawn Neeland is the safer pick. Jonah Ellis is the higher upside pick. What do you want? I think you want the pass rush. I think it's Jonah Ellis. You know, I said, I said, Joe Witt, Dan Quinn, choose violence. And I feel like Marshawn Neeland is the more violent player here. But we're going to bring you in, Marshawn. There you go. That fits the consensus board as well. And brings Philadelphia back up onto the clock. What are we doing, Philly? Probably like an offensive line here. I think if Kellen Moore gets a say in this, we might be going Christian Haynes here. The more immediate need. And he's a scheme fit for what you want to do. So, let's do it. Sorry, Miami. That sucks. And Kansas City says they're down for this. I'm doing this because I want Cedric Von Prawn. But I don't want to spend up to get him. I'd rather reach a little ways to get him. We're going to get another guy here in the third for future fourth back to KC. Moving some of our resources up to get a few more guys. That's okay. We don't have a lot here. Um, let's do that. This isn't the Kansas City trade. C computer, you can figure this out. You're okay with it, though. Um, I could see Kansas City maybe... Uh, they really want somebody. Who do they want? I mean, Keon Coleman's here. That could make sense. You know, that could make sense at this point. Let's do it. See what the computer does with it, but I can justify it for Keon Coleman. So we're going to trade back with KC. We didn't have, they weren't calling us, but we called them and we came up with a plan here. Uh, and KC said, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. We were sleeping on that. Keon Coleman was still on the board. Yep, there we go. They picked him. All right. Brings Dallas on the clock here. Wide receiver, I love adding. Yeah, we're going to do that. That's uh, That seems like a nice little, maybe not even value yet, but uh, a good spot to get Leggett off of the board. Possibly a value, too. He's growing on me. Buffalo Bills on the clock next. Did we move back or something here? What are we doing? It would make sense if they wanted wide receiver to jump up here. Move 128 up to 101. And what are we giving up? Braden Fisk. I don't think we want to give up on Braden Fisk. I don't think we want to move back. That's probably the best uh, fits a need. And yeah. Feel like I can see that in Buffalo. And with that, our plan starts to go in place. Miami. Um... It is a little bit of a reach here, and we're going to do that. So Washington on the clock next. We might be able to wait for the fourth round even for some of that. So, yeah, we'll go tackle now, and we'll figure out what we want in a little bit. And New England up on the clock. Still needs some offensive line, right? And interior defense. Uh, what do we have here? 103. We'll probably get O-line there. We'd be open to... Nope, you're not a good trade partner, Detroit. Get away. All right. Um, I'm going to go Chris Jenkins. I think he's higher on consensus board as well. So, yeah, we'll go very close. We'll go with the consensus board and my rankings on that one. And uh, this is not... Just because... We know we can, hopefully, probably. Uh, we'll listen to Detroit's offer. Okay, we'll do a future fourth, six uh, swap here with Detroit just to get something to move back before making this pick because we know that the consensus board says that this guy should be around for a while. And, you know, if New England's learned anything about taking offensive linemen early, um, at least to get something 
before you go ahead and make that trade. So we're going to do that. Sorry, there's going to be a little bit of PTSD here for you New England fans. Um, but trust me, I think you're going to be getting a good guy out of it. All right. Of course, I thought that with uh, the offensive lineman you took a couple of years ago. Um, that hasn't quite turned out yet to be worth where you took him. Although I didn't have a first round draft grade on him either. Uh, New York Giants on the clock. Andrew Phillips. All right, so next up, we're going to look at our edge, interior defensive line, uh, running back need. We could address that here. Is it too early to address your running back position, New York? Uh, I'll, I'll go consensus here. We'll get you Trey Benson. Uh, I like Jonathan Brooks a little bit more. Uh, you guys definitely a team who could be a little bit patient on that. Um, yeah, sorry, New York. But you're going to get one heck of a running back. Uh, you know from Saquon Barkley how much that actually helps you win games. We would like uh, probably a weapon for this offense. It's going to piss off Aaron Rodgers a little bit. But his drop concerns aren't as big as, I mean, if you look at Troy Franklin, his uh, drop percentage was like 10 and like down here. Um, so it's not, it wasn't like a plague on him like it was during this uh, draft process. So let's get you a nice deep weapon for Aaron. I think that does match a little bit of need that you, well, and this just opens up. You have enough underneath weapons. They're going to do it. Um, it's possible Jalen Polk, Jermaine Burton could also be the guys here. I think the main thing is, is we are running into a spot where it makes sense to get wide receiver. There are some good names left. And I do expect that in the draft. I do think there will be some wide receivers uh, that are decent falling, maybe not even necessarily falling, but going in this third round area here. Um, it's, it's a pretty darn deep wide receiver class, and that's why you can look past it in the first round. Uh, and be fine. So that brings New England on to the clock next. So I'm going to go offensive line. Is this why I, I traded back to go O-line? And I wanted to give you... Okay, tell you what I'm going to do, New England fan, with this pick. I was going to go Christian Jones. That's what I was talking about. Um, and I have Dominic Pooney actually ranked higher than Christian Jones in my rankings. Both of them, uh, consensus board, this is too high for. So we're going to make a little bit of a, a comp, uh, come to a, an agreement here. Blake Fisher, consensus board, we're approaching that type of draft area, and he is the true tackle. The reason I was going to go Christian Jones over Dominic Pooney is there are some teams may not view Dominic Pooney as a tackle. Uh, I do think he has the ability to play tackle or guard, but uh, some teams might be concerned about him at tackle and, and say he's just a guard. We're specifically, we are looking for a tackle here. So it was between this, Christian Jones. Uh, for me personally, I, I, would, I would take Christian Jones over Blake Fisher. But uh, either way, there you go. We're going to get that tackle for you, New England. And we picked up a little bit of capital before doing that. New York Jets back on the clock. We just grabbed them, that wide receiver. Offensive line depth, uh, definitely on top of mind here. But what else do we need? I think we're looking at safety around this part of the draft. Might be the best option for the Jets. Uh, that is our biggest need as well. After this, we're going to have to wait to 111. So we're going to miss out on a tier of those guys if we don't go this route. Um, one thing I will point out for New England, you know, you're looking at this and you're still seeing Chris Jenkins, Tavondre Sweat uh, on the board here uh, not too long ago, Rook Aroro. Aro, um, all available this into the third. It just, you know, I, going the route I did with Byron Murphy in the first round might not be the route to go. I don't know. I'm going to go Camp Kitchens here. Uh, maybe they'd have a, a better preference. He's next up. And I'm just just saying this is about the time where maybe one of these safeties is uh, the safety that they like. Camp Kitchens is the highest on the consensus board. Uh, and this board. Not my board. I like Kalen Bullock a little bit more. But I don't think that Kalen Bullock is the guy that the Jets would be looking into. Could be wrong on that. I don't think so. So we'll go Camp Kitchens. Do you think wide receiver is uh, a possibility for Washington? The board's still looking pretty good there. Oh, Malachi Corley's still available. 
I think they're a team who could really like Malachi Corley. He fits exactly what I'm talking about uh, earlier in terms of needs for them. All right, so I was keeping my eyes on safeties. We're still good there in terms of Washington. And looking forward, I think I saw Green Bay attack a safety. Oh, no, it was linebacker. All right, so still keeping Washington in mind here for safety. Uh, not going to be able to trade off with Dallas for that. Uh, Green Bay up on the clock next. They might be in the, uh, looking for a safety. If they don't take one here, I might pause here and look for a possible trade up with them. And obviously, you'll see that if it happens. Dallas on the clock next. Possibly running backs available. Nope. Nope. See, all the more reason why New York Giants wanted to do that. Screw over Dallas here at pick 87. Maybe we'll want to trade back from here. Sometimes, sometimes these things just work, okay? Washington, we're going to make you pay. Is that too much? Okay, so we are going to have to pay, but... You know, it's not, we're, we're, we'll do this. Uh, whoops, other way around. We're gonna have to pay, but we're gonna get a little bit of future something something back here. That should work. So it kind of sucks for both of us. Washington, yeah, you're giving two picks to Dallas here, but Dallas, uh, we kind of need those picks, so, we're also going to be giving you a third, but that's in the future for the fifth. So we're still getting something back there. You know, uh, they're both playing a little bit of hardball with each other, but they, they also find a, a trade partner in one another. Um, not likely, you know. But sometimes the universe just works out like that. And Washington's going to hop ahead of Green Bay because they want... Is it Kalen Bullock? I don't think it's Kalen Bullock. I think it's Adrian Taylor Demerson. I'm getting the third guy down on the consensus um, board. But I can tell you, Adrian Taylor has his absolute lovers as well. Um, and ultimately on the consensus board, we're not reaching too much. Just some of these guys have fallen. Uh, and I just think he's the best match for what they would be looking for in Washington. And uh, it could be Green Bay. So I could see you trying to block that. Ooh, Jermaine Burton going to Green Bay. And Jalen Polk. Okay. All right, computer. That's a little too random there, but okay. Uh, Dolphins on the clock next. You're going to want physical. I mean, Renardo Green's going to be a nice match. Be a nice match for what we want to do here. Um, I believe. Get. Oh, oh, look at this. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. I didn't realize this. Bada bing. Bada. 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 Bada boom. Like Mason McCormick is just such a good fit for what you want. The zone. It's the zone, okay? Athletic. They were right up here. No. I know Miami. I understand that there are other people who have fallen in this draft some places. I think these are two great fits for you. I think they're two guys who could be going higher come uh, draft day than expected. It's possible Devondre Sweat could drop in the draft because of the weight concerns of him not being a three-down guy. I don't think he's getting out of day two. We're going to assume that Devondre Sweat's not available and, you know, maybe that means Dominic Pooney or somebody would be, but we'll just live with that. It's not a perfect world. Yeah, and it looks like he is uh, going there for a top 30 visit. I think that's a good match. Um, you know, I'm sorry, Dallas, if it doesn't work out, because I don't know that it will. But I, I can see them drafting him. I can see it all. And they are showing interest in him, bringing him in for a top 30 visit. So there is a pick one, Dallas. I think that worked out moving back for that. And center cornerback defensive end interior defense sweat uh, let's see here 
Yeah, so there are still a few guys that I think you can just uh, pick up and use available in free agency. I don't know if all of these guys are still available, but I think I think uh, that's a pretty good list. Yeah, I think they might still be all available here in free agency. So I think um, Dallas, we're just not going to reach too hard here. Instead, we are going to look at cornerback. Uh, I need to verify about the nickel situation there. Otherwise, it's interior defensive line. I mean, maybe we just go Devondre Sweat. Let's make it easy. Let's let's put a cap on this here with Devondre Sweat. Um, if he's available here, you, you're taking him, right? Yeah, at this point, I'm two and a half hours into recording. Um, we'll get into the recap here in just a second, just kind of showing you that first round again. But... Um, yeah, two and a half hours in recording, so we just we just uh, finished that off with Tavondre Sweat, despite the likelihood of him being available there. And it's time to wrap up each of these drafts, just give you a couple final thoughts and show you the entirety of the draft hall there at the bottom of the screen. For the Buffalo Bills, we stuck and we picked for each of their picks. Brian Thomas Jr., Braden Fisk there at pick 60. They are a team that I think will be open to moving back, but in each of these scenarios... Um, I just really didn't even hardly think about it, right? Brian Thomas Jr. at pick 28, Braden Fisk at pick 60. The fit draft needs here for Buffalo, and there's a lot of upside with them. Tough to to uh, look elsewhere. And I did make a fatal error here at center for the Dolphins with uh, not... I, I did not calculate in the needs chart uh, for the addition of Aaron Brewer when that occurred, apparently. Or maybe I just made some, some sort of error. Uh, well, I did at some point, so... Uh, center, not a need for this team. My mistake on that, and that did mean, uh, and and in doing some of that digging, I also realized that safety might be appears to be a need for Miami. So I added that in here. Uh, that went to Ben in the, the beginning of the video. So let me know if you think that's a good addition, and is that a good spot to have them? Should it be higher? Uh, the 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 safety that they added this year, Jordan Poyer, right? Mm -hmm. I think that was a one year deal. So um, people still think that's a need. As far as the draft hall then, uh, had Cedric Von Prawn taken at pick 264. Unfortunately, wasn't able to go back and see exactly what was left on the board. But I do think I do think Kalen Bullock made it like throughout the entirety of this. So um, I haven't taken Kalen Bullock. Uh, there were there was Edge Jonah Ellis there. There was um, you know of course some prospect tackles. I'm sure. Oh, uh, Jatavian Sanders tight end was available there. Uh, you know, fill fill that spot with your imagination since I screwed that up. But uh, this is what I ended up doing because, uh, in part, I went and looked at their uh, the 30s list for the um, top 30 players that Miami has brought in for one, uh, you know, for solo conversations with these guys and uh, checking them out. And Kalen Bullock was on that list. Uh, no edge rushers, actually, that they brought in on their top 30 list. So uh, they probably have their mind set up there. But Kalen Bullock and Jaden Hicks were both on the list. So that tells me that they might have some plans uh, day two to be taking a safety. Uh, you know, they're definitely open to that idea. So that was part of the reason for that. That's going to bring us on to the New England Patriots. Drake May, Lad McConkey, Blake Fisher there. Uh, by the way, Blake Fisher is a top 30 visit for New England. So they're definitely looking at him specifically. And this just, uh, this feels very Patriots and fits their needs. This feels like this could be what actually happens in my opinion. And uh, we did move back from pick 68 to 73 there. Picked up a little bit of capital along the way. So that's always good, and um, and this feels very likely, despite the fact that I would have taken a different offensive tackle there. Um, the more likely scenario would be Blake Fisher than who I like, uh, based on the odds of you know what other people like. As far as the New York Jets go, about pick ten, pick three seventy two. Uh, pick ten, we we moved back a couple of spots, took Byron Murphy. So uh, the big question is, is was that worth it? Essentially, I, would, I, I think New York Jets fans, you're going to say probably not. We should have stuck at 10, taken Taliesa Fuanga. And then, uh, you know, it depends what you think of Tez Walker there uh, in the third round, but uh, limited wide receiver options. So I, I gave you who I thought was going to be the best pick and was probably next up on consensus board, et cetera. But, um, you know, was it worth moving back those three spots? Uh, I don't know, but I will tell you, I got a feeling that Jets uh, decision makers might feel fine, especially for the first round with what they've got on that offensive line 
uh, they might not want Tali Fuanga anymore. I, I do think that they were connected with him and like him, uh, but they might prefer to move back get a little bit of extra draft capital and uh, be happy with Byron Murphy because that's, you know, that's how the Jets draft. I uh, got to take a defensive guy there first and, and you get a little extra capital by moving back three spots. Heck yeah. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I assume most of you would rather have had just uh, stuck at pick 10, Telia Safwanga, and then, and then here, uh, Div- you know, Tez Walker, whatever the case, somebody else. But um, yeah, let me know if that's the case. Would you have rather just stuck there, uh, screw that extra capital? I- ignore the fact that that extra capital ends up being Cameron Kinchins. Uh, pretend it's, I don't know, somebody else, but that's going to bring us on to, could be like a Malachi Corley. That'd be an interesting Jets pick. That's going to bring us on to the Dallas Cowboys. Pick 24, 56, 87, where they moved out to 87 and got 99 and 100 for a third, fifth swap kind of deal. And so, uh, Marius Mims, Xavier Leggett, Braylon Allen, Tavondre Sweat. This is an off of the bus, uh, you know, scare your opponents into winning like you've won the game before it even started kind of crew here. Boom or bust going on. You just have these four guys walk off of the bus and flex. It, the game is over. You know, I, mean, I don't know about Tavondre Sweat flexing, but the other three for sure just have them flex and, and they'll break their shirts off and, uh, and Tavondre Sweat just standing in front of them like, yeah, you got to get through me first, but then these guys, they'll beat you up pretty good. In all areas of the field too, wide receiver, running back, offensive tackle, defensive, interior defensive line, uh, big dudes, strong dudes in general. Yeah, it's a cool draft. Uh, very much. I, you know, it wouldn't be a surprising Dallas draft here. What do you think of it, Dallas? Um, I assume it's boom or bust. So I assume, you know, maybe you love two of these guys. Maybe you don't like two of these guys, whatever the case. Um, I assume you got to at least love part of this draft. So there you go. Dallas, New York Giants up next. And I totally, I screwed the pooch on the Giants draft here. I should have been looking quarterback there with pick 47. So I picked 47. Ended up going Michael Penix Jr. here in a revision of this draft. And then uh, I was kind of ignoring cornerback because I went Tyler Newbin. And people tend to get annoyed in the comments. Like, oh, you went two two offensive linemen. Yeah, you got five offensive linemen. If you have two offensive linemen that are good, there's still three that you can take in the first three rounds. I don't care that you're taking the same position quote unquote you still need more of them so people get mad when you do two secondaries two offensive linemen i think that was kind of shying me away from cornerback there at pick 70 and nothing wrong with trey benson and new york does need uh, some help with the running back position but i think cornerback probably a bigger need andrew phillips i love the guy uh there at pick 70 i think would make a lot of sense for the giants so we're gonna go roma dunze michael penix andrew phillips sticking and picking in each of those cases uh that works with with how the draft fell would you prefer that new york giants fan to tyler newbin trey benson i assume so but let me know if not i would be curious or if you would like trey benson over andrew phillips or something like that too would be very curious to hear that um but that's the giants draft philadelphia eagles draft we stuck and we picked uh across the board here so dallas turner fell to us in this draft you know it's not likely but i do think that it is possible that we're uh overvaluing dallas turner you get passed up by a couple of guys and we often see at least one of those edge guys go into the 20s it it could be dallas turner out of the three um once again that's not what we expect but if he's there i pick 22 uh, Philadelphia Eagles fans, you like that. Then we got TJ Tampa. Need help in that secondary, whether you like it or not. And uh, Christian Haynes there to help that offensive line, which was uh, definitely, uh, you know, going to be helpful there. So I think that is a fine draft. It's it's totally different than anything I've ever done because I've never uh, experienced taking Dallas Turner there at pick 22 for them. So that was fun. That's going to bring us on to the Washington Commanders. And let me know what you think of this. There, there is the whole uh, crew there for the first three rounds. I do think that um, I could understand you being a little bit underwhelmed. There's a little bit of um, maybe it depends. Like, what do you think of Marshawn Nealand? If you like him, then you like the pick. If you don't like him, which you might not, then you think that we reached for him. Same with like, Kyron Amagadi. If you like him... Uh, great you know it's you wish that you get a more polished guy but what can you do there in the third round so uh, kyron amagaji very very high end prospect might not be the best day one 
wide receiver Malachi Corley. You either like him or you hate him. You know, he is a boom bust. He's either going to be great in the league or at least fairly good or not really do much. I, I don't see a whole lot of middle ground with him. So I understand you might not be in love with that if you're not in love with Malachi Corley. But I do think that that's the type of guy that Washington would be looking for. Same with Adrian Taylor, Demerson. Uh, maybe you're familiar with him. Maybe not. A lot of people, he's like a my guy for several people. So a lot of people really do like him a lot. And I think out of the uh, safeties remaining, even though he was the third lowest on the consensus board, out of the other two, he was the one that I think Washington would be looking at uh, seriously, given what they're looking for on defense. And that was part of this exercise. So I like that. Nate Wiggins, you know, falling all the way to the second round. Obviously, that's a strong start there with Jaden Daniels, Nate Wiggins. And then after that, I don't know. What do you like? And don't forget, though, I did get you an extra future third round draft pick there little bit you know he gave a fifth round up for in part with that deal but um that's part of this too future third round don't think that that doesn't have any value it's future second round just got stefan Diggs away from a team so don't underestimate the value of these picks even a third rounder still quite valuable uh just last year buffalo was able to get an experienced good uh cornerback to help their cornerback room to help them you know in their mind hopefully and and he did he did help them win some games uh, you know, stay in the playoff run in a year that they were struggling and, and hopefully make a playoff push. It didn't quite work out for him, but that's what a third round pick can get you that, that final push that you, your team may need. So that is it. Thank you very, very much. Love you. And, uh, stay tuned for more of these types of videos. Peace out.